Squash Alchemy. I'm Lisa Camilleri and my guest today is Noran Gohar from Cairo, Egypt. Noran, you won the British Junior Open three times. Your first British Junior you won at the age of 14, the second British Junior title at the age of 17, and then your third British Junior title at the age of 18. You won the World Junior Championships back to back in 2015 and 2016. You joined PSA in 2011 at the age of 13. You won your first PSA title, the Cathay Pacific Open in Hong Kong in 2016 at the age of 18. You're currently ranked number two in the world. Congratulations on all your achievements um, in your career so far. Noran Goha, welcome and thank you for joining me here at Squash Alchemy. Thank you so much, Lisa, for this introduction. It's like a huge <laughs> one, and that uh, one. Um, I'm very honored on it, and uh, thank you very much. I <laughs> know oh, you're welcome. Um, I'd like to kick it off with just a, a question on how did you start playing squash, and what age were you when you started playing? So basically, I started playing when I was eight and a half, maybe. Um, I used to play gymnastics and swimming before, but I hated both of them. Like, it was really tough training sessions, and the timing of trainings as well were, were really harsh. Like, I had to wake up early to go for my swimming classes and everything, so I hated them. And then my dad used to play squash as just with his friend as a hobby and he really loved the game at that time and it was quite popular in Egypt at that time because we had Al Ahram uh, tournament being played and Barada was something big in Egypt. So I went with him one day and I hit the ball with him a little bit and, and one of the coaches saw me and he was like, oh, you're athletic, you, you, you can be a good squash player. But my age was a problem because in Egypt, usually you start when you're around five or six years old and eight and a half was quite old. So I had to do a lot of work to catch up like all the other juniors. Um, the, yeah, that's how it all started. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so you say, yeah, at the age of eight, which is a little later, but I mean, yeah. you then joined PSA at the age of 13. So, you know, only three you know, a few years later. Um, so that was a pretty early, or is it, is it normal for, you know, you guys to, from Egypt to join PSA at an early age, or did you just really love it and see that you were really good and say, oh, I'm going to join PSA? I think it's both of them. Like uh, in Egypt, we have this culture that we start really young. So we do everything really young at a very young age. So maybe, and I wouldn't be able to catch up and play well like the other girls if I didn't really love the game and I really wanted to improve in it. But the, the decision of joining PSA wasn't mainly my decision. It was about my coaches. They wanted the, for me that I gain more experience. And I didn't quite like join PSA full time and professionally like I started to travel to PSA tournaments, I think, when I was 15. But starting from 13 years old, I was playing the PSA tournaments in Egypt. So they were like, you have to gain experience and it's a good opportunity um, that you play matches with more experienced players and from all over the world. So I think I was very lucky and very grateful that I was given some local uh, uh, local spots in PSA tournaments in Orgada. And, and there were a few, I think, 5K tournaments as well. And it gave me a lot of experience and uh, from a very young age. So I think I was very lucky, but at the same time, there was some hard work behind it. So, yeah, sure. So when you say, you know, you started at the age of eight and you had a bit of catching up, um, yeah. what was your training? Like when you started playing, you know, how many hours a day were you training and what did the training consist of? So I think I had a, because I played like some sports before, so I had like a good fitness level. I was like my endurance and drawing around the court and um, I had a good like athletic shape. Um, but it was all about how to improve my skills on court. And I think solo was uh, played a huge part in it. Like I used to stay on court maybe from two to three hours. I could like just hit the ball. <laughs> um, and sometimes they were like closing the court and I would still be hitting the, court, the ball. And <laughs> I just loved it. I just loved being on court and, and playing. Um, 
I think when I was eight or nine, I used to train quite a lot cons- compared to other players. Like I used to play around four to five hours a day. Um, some solo, a lot of solo, um, some drills with my coach, uh, practice matches, fitness. Um, and I just carried this routine till I ended my junior career, I think. Uh-huh. And then once you ended your junior career, did the training change dramatically from junior to pro? I won't say like dram- like drastically, but it, it was like quite gradually. It, it took like a shape, like when you are turning pro, you are having from 10 to 12 tournaments a year that you have to play. So your body is an asset that you have to take care of. And I didn't have this idea when I was a junior, like, the recovery uh, things to do and all this stuff it wasn't really in my mind whereas now it it plays a big component uh, in my career and i have to take care of my body like um because it's something that you have trained a lot like for maybe 14 15 years but now it's about maintaining the body and just um keeping it in in a good uh, shape but at the same time, not overloading it. So I think it's a different approach. When you're a junior, uh, you're still fresh. You you are trying to um, to improve uh, to improve a lot of things in your fitness as well. Uh, now it's more about maintaining and uh, not getting injured. I think. Yeah, sure. So if you could break down a week, um, like a, a weekly training schedule, how you know what would each day consist of, and could you go so, and? Yeah, usually we train six days a week. We have one one day that is completely off. And in Egypt, it's Friday, usually. Um, Because Friday is also off from university for me. So for me, it's like just a day to to shut down and not think about anything. Um, And then we start the week with Saturday. And Saturday, the first session is usually a light one. You just try to kick off your body and start to work. So I go for a fitness one and it's a light one. And then in the afternoon, maybe some conditioning games. And then Sunday, Monday, Wednesday are the same type of days. So it's I really like to do my fitness training really early in the morning, like maybe at 8, 7, 8 a.m. And then either I'm having a solo session or a drill session with my coach. And then I'm having classes, like my university classes. And then I go back home, rest a little bit, and then... Uh, practice matches in the afternoon mm-hmm. Tuesday is just a half day so in the morning just drill session with the coach and some mobility and activation session just to recover it depends how heavy was the week or how my body's feeling but usually Thursday is either a condition game or a practice match and um, I go for yoga in the afternoon as well and that's it okay so it's a pretty jam-packed week yeah. <laughs> juggle with university and training is that tough it is, it is definitely very tough, but I felt I didn't really, um, I really wanted to be a pro squash player, but at the same time, there is a big risk because, as I said before, your body is your asset. So if you have a very big injury, you just have to stop. So I just wanted to have like a backup plan. Um, and university was just the backup plan for me. Um, I'm studying construction engineering, which I really like, actually. So I think if it wasn't about squash, it would be more about studies. So uh, and I really enjoy both. Um, it's tough. It's completely tough. But I think I get my satisfaction from being good at both and getting results in 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 both of in both careers is a very satisfying thing. But for me, the formula was about not my life is not only about squash there's other aspects in life and it really helped me on the squash court because it, it pulls, pulls out a little bit of the pressure yeah um because sometimes when squash isn't working really well uh it's very depressing and uh, and you feel like your life isn't really going well so it helps when you're having something important as important as squash besides. So if it doesn't really work well, you're like, oh, you know what? Okay, squash, maybe it's not working really well, but I have something else to focus on. And sometimes when you get back on court, you're more fresh and you're more looking forward to it and you really want to improve. 
Um, so yeah, that's that's the balance I figured out was over the years. I won't say like from the first year I was like, yeah, that's that's how it works. And it was really difficult. Like uh, there was some time both weren't weren't working at all. <laughs> like I was doing really well in my studies and squash. I wasn't really enjoying it. So I was like, oh, <laughs> I have to find something <laughs> else. <laughs> but yeah, but uh, but it's like a miracle when both are working really well. And it happened actually at the Bridge Open. Like I did very very well at my exams. Like just the day before traveling to the Bridge Open and. Like five days after on the bridge open, I was like, oh, that's mm-hmm. like a dream I'm living. Yeah, so yeah it's, um, it's tough, but it's really re- rewarding and I'm really enjoying it right now, yeah. Yeah, good. Um, so when you started playing PSA um, at such a young age, was, that a, was there a lot of um, pressure on you? I won't say uh, pressure because I didn't feel pressure at all, like to win matches. Um, no, I felt like I was really grateful and really happy to be on court with top 20 or top 30 players. I felt I had a very big chance. And um, I wasn't really intimidated, so it helped. Like, like I love the game. I just want to be on court and play my best. Um, but I felt this pressure, actually, when I was climbing the rankings and other players were like catching me up and trying to, to beat me. But um, at the very beginning, it was like a very enjoyable one. But I would say I felt uh, I got mature uh, very quickly. <laughs> and it's good and bad because when you get mature very quickly, you feel like, and you are winning, for example, and it's going your way really well, you feel like it's always going to be this way. Mm-hmm. So when you, you face your downs, you're like, oh, that's really strange. And you feel like, no, I didn't experience this this type of down. To be able to face this kind of problem because I wasn't used to it when, when I was young. Like when I was young, I, I didn't think about anything. I was just playing. But when you start to play and you start to win and you're having a certain ranking or something and you're like, you start putting on yourself pressure without even feeling it. And it was mainly about the team around me, like my coach, um, my mom. My mom played a huge role like in my squash career in general. Uh, my dad, uh, of course, he's, he's the reason why I'm playing this. But, but I felt like the support I had and the belief they had in me, it really helped me like get back on track. How many months a year do you play tournaments and do you sort of pick um, a certain amount of tournaments to play per year and how many months do you have off for your off season? So we started the season in September, uh, beginning of September and we ended in uh, mid-June, maybe it was the word series being uh, in June. Uh, um, so we're having like two and a half months of off season, which is great i i like when i was playing junior and the psa i i i didn't used to have this off season actually because during the off season i was preparing for the world juniors <laughs> so i never quite trusted and the fun bit is when i wasn't a junior anymore i was like how how can i take an off season like rest for two or three weeks it was really weird for me I was like no I have to train <laughs> I'm having a tournament to prepare to and I was like oh I'm not a junior anymore actually <laughs> so yeah uh, but since uh, since 19 years old um, um, I just take two weeks off and then I start playing but not like completely off like yeah maybe a week like I'm not doing anything but then the other week is like just very minimal activity like maybe some yoga stretching um so that the transition between being like resting completely and getting back to training won't be very hard so there's this intermediate phase where you just try to activate your body in a very smooth and uh, easy way so swimming yoga stretching stuff like that and then um and then usually the first two weeks are just about fitness and endurance. Um, and then gradually you go to the more specific parts of the game, like from from track sessions to footwork sessions. Uh, in squash, for example, you go from really long sessions uh, of, uh, of uh, playing basic games and stuff to more tactical things. 
So I think you just go gradually from the very big image to the more small and specific things you want to improve. And yeah, I try to watch my like the the milestones matches I had the, the the year before just to focus on the good and bad things I did, and it helps because it reminds you of good things you used to do and maybe you forgot how you, you used to do it. And the bad things um, sometimes when someone is telling you, you know, you are doing this very bad or you're hitting this ball or you're show, you, your game like your lance is very short, you don't really realize it until you, you yourself watch it. So I think it really helps to, uh, to improve as well. So. Yeah, that's that's a pretty good tip, doing a bit of video <laughs> analysis. I mean, I know I didn't, in my you know career, I didn't do a lot of it. And I think it's such a great tool, so beneficial to watch your matches. And yeah, especially that you have Squash TV and you have a lot of, like, they're trying to, to go live a lot. Like, even in the tournaments where it's, it's all about the traditional courts. They try to put like live broadcast and stuff. So I think it's more accessible now to 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 get these videos and to watch it actually. Mm. Your um your backhand is probably one of the you know best backhands I've I've ever seen, and you're such a hard hitter of the ball. Have you done a lot of work on technique? Like, is technique a big element of your training? Definitely. I think uh, I took some time. Um, like they didn't want me just to to hit the ball and and just run and they weren't really like wanting me to um, to catch up in in a in like without technique actually they they my 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 style and my technique was a very big part when I was young like my coach would would say that's why I'm telling you solo was very important because during solos they they were like rectifying some stuff in my swings and stuff because when you are older it's harder actually to 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 change things in your swings and it really helps in like generating power and uh, preventing you actually from injuring yourself like sometimes when you're having a bad swing or some some movements that aren't really correct for the body um, the risk is higher that you get injured so i think it was very important for them that I play with a good technique from the very beginning, and I, I always loved the backhand side. Like I was really bored when when we used to play on the forehand side, and then one of my coach used to take me on the backhand side. I was like really excited, and <laughs> so I think it was something maybe I was gifted with from the very beginning. But definitely, I tried to just nurture it and uh, and uh, take advantage of it. Uh, but definitely, I love to play on the backhand side more than the forehand <laughs> till now. Yes, yeah, yeah, such a beautiful technique. Um, I know you're currently in Ramadan, so does your training workload decrease during this time? Uh, usually, yes, and uh, definitely now, yes, and yes, <laughs> because it's Ramadan and it's quarantine. Um, so yeah, because um, we we fast for about. I think 16 to 17 hours and uh, without drinking or eating. So um, before iftar, which is the time you, you break your fasting, um, uh, I like actually to train before, like straight before iftar. Um, maybe like having a drill session, like before iftar for me is like the morning session in a normal day. But the the load and the the level of uh, intensity of the training isn't that high uh, because you can't drink or eat and you're not having a lot of energy but then when you eat and then you go back on court it's actually <laughs> not really nice because you're really heavy <laughs> so but usually after iftar you try just during iftar to um to eat something light and then go on court and have a practice mat and then when you go back home, you have a pre Um Yeah, but the, the level of intensity, I think it, it like the number of hours, maybe it's the same, but the level of intensity really decreases during Ramadan. And you just try to, to make the best out of the practice match that you're having in the, in, in the evening, which is quite late, actually. Like usually um, our evening session would, would start maybe around 9 p.m. is like really early in Ramadan. So maybe it's like 10 p.m. I would say average. And uh, for before iftar, I think it would be maybe around 4 p.m. Okay. So. So last question um, that I'd like to sort of ask a lot of the players from what you've learned so far in your career, 
Um, what advice would you give to a junior wanting to pursue squash as their main sport? If you really want to play squash, you really have to be disciplined and you really have to be a hard worker. We have seen a lot of very talented players, but because they didn't have this work ethics and not being hardworking enough, they didn't reach their goal or their potential that they should have reached. Mm -hmm. Which is obviously the case in all sports, but squash especially because you travel a lot, so definitely you spend a lot of money. Um, and at the very beginning, you don't really earn a lot, I think. But uh, but you don't have to take it like you don't have to think about the economical part of it. You just have to to focus on how you can improve yourself. Mm. Um, and for me, I said it before, I thought that squash is a very nice thing and I would love to play it as long as my body would keep me playing the sport. But sometimes putting too much pressure on yourself on squash alone can be actually dangerous on your squash career. Mm -hmm. So you just have to figure it out, other hobbies that you have or other interests that you have, so that maybe when this plan of pursuing your squash career isn't really working, you don't get depressed and you're having something else that is backing it up. Um, but that doesn't mean that you don't like put 100% in squash, but just have it in your mind that, oh, you know what? I have something else in my life that I can do. So just enjoy it. Like squash is here. It's your passion. It's something, it's not your job, not, do not take it as your job maybe it's your job uh, to make money or, or anything but it's your passion before being your job mm. yeah well thank you so much for your time it was so nice to be able to get into you know a little bit more in depth on what Noran's coaching uh what your training's like from week to week and what it's like to be on pro tour and some awesome tips i mean i think you know just listening to you you're such a hard worker um, you're very time management and just so committed. And and I think working out, you know, having a balance between squash and other things in life is such an important element. So that's really good advice to give. So thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure to chat with you today. And um, yeah, I wish you all the luck for the rest of your career. Thank you so much, Linda. It's really nice being with you today.